decision is is uh, is how should I put it? What term? You have the right to edit the video, don't you? Even if the decision is lacking. Had this been the narrative, I would have no quarrel with my leadership because that's the responsibility of the leadership to take such decision if necessary. And of course, uh, uh, the Oslo Accords represent a setback. The <coughs> I'll, I'll use a, I, I will use polite, polite uh, uh, terminology. The, <coughs> the the damaging uh, uh, stipulation of Oslo are transparent, and uh, as consequence of the damaging stipulations uh, of Oslo uh, negotiations of the past two or decades have come to naught, but there is a but. And I came to realize uh, the, uh, what I'm about to say to camera only recently. <coughs> the PLO, and I'm specifically talking about my own movement, I joined the faculty while teaching and researching in, in the United Kingdom, university teacher and academic researcher, in 1984. I joined the Fatah in 1984. And ten years later, uh, I and most of Fatah Kaudar were faced with uh, the de facto <coughs> accreditation of the Oslo Accords. At that time, I was oblivious a, of a, of a, of a, of a uh, consideration which occurred to me, as I said before, only recently. Fatah launched the challenge, the arm challenge, to the to apartheid Israel settler colonial policies in 1965 with the first guerrilla operation inside Israel. But the PLO set itself initially as an institution in Jordan. The PLO built itself in Jordan and eventually was viewed by the Jordanian government and monarchy as establishing a state within a state. Now, the sovereignty of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan has been legitimized internationally. There was no dispute about the legitimacy of Jordanian sovereignty. No sovereign state would allow the PLO to set it up, itself up as a state within a state, and the consequence of that contradiction was, is known as the Black September, and the PLO relocated to the Lebanon. The same situation emerged in the Lebanon. The Lebanese sovereignty over Lebanon is internationally legitimized and recognized, and the PLO, by design and or by default, built itself in Lebanon as a state within a state. The consequence of that was the Lebanese civil war and the relocation of the PLO in Tunis. It occurred to me, and again I repeat rather progressively and recently, that the only territory where the sovereignty of the sovereign is not international law, is not recognized and legitimized internationally, is the Israeli claim to sovereignty and military occupation of the post-1967 occupied territories. The decision to relocate via Oslo in the post-1967 occupied territories may have been not only a necessary decision, but also a wise decision. That is the only territory where the PLO is located. Okay. The, only, the only territory, the sovereignty of which is challenged, it's, it's occupation, illegal occupation by an apartheid state, and therefore building 
aiming to build a state under that fragile sovereignty is not, may not have been just only a necessary consideration, but also a wise consideration. <clears throat> well, every human situation is bereft with contradictions, and the contradiction of our current situation are apparent for all to see. The recent element that has been introduced into the various <coughs> ideological and political and <coughs> societal consideration is the launch of the international BDS movement worldwide. Beginning with the Palestinian call for BDSing Israeli academic institutions launched by Palestinian civil society in 2005. We are now over a decade uh, uh, since that call and uh, the movement is doing wonderfully well and the recent hysterical Israeli attempted legislation or even <coughs> accredited legislation in the Israeli apartheid parliament, the Knesset, the, the hysterical uh, response to uh, the successes of the BDS is an indication of the success of the BDS and uh, I, I regard it uh, as, as, uh, as uh, important in that it suggests a core weakness in the apartheid Israeli system. They will not succeed to suppress international BDS and they will not succeed in trying to block the classification of apartheid Israel in the United Nations as an apartheid state, not just as a Zionist state, but as an apartheid state. And once this is achieved, Israel will be subject not only by civil society, not only by civil society, boycott, divestment and sanctions, but by UN boycott, divestment and sanctions under the International Covenant for the Suppression and Punishment of the crime of apartheid, and I have long, and I, I, I'm 75 this year, and my hope is that should I be allowed to celebrate my 90th birthday, I live to see this happen. <coughs> Dr. Davis, there is a, a new bill being proposed in committee now, being sent to the Knesset of Israel, which is proposing to define Israel, whether it has always claimed to be, but it, which it never had any legitimacy to claim. But now it is seeking legitimacy in the form of a basic law to declare itself to be a Jewish nation a state. What is this phenomenon being called a Jewish nation state? And is it in contradiction with Israel's other self-definition of itself as a democratic state. Well, the, Israel is defined as a Jewish and a democratic state in law, in basic law. <coughs> it's, uh, I, I should be able to recover its official translation. I'm not, I'm not, I hope I'm not too wrong. It's, Human dignity, human dignity and liberty, I think, is the official translation. The Jew, uh, official translation of the basic law. The first article of this basic law is identifying Israel as a Jewish and democratic state, and that is, of course, an oxymoron. <coughs> there is no Jewish people except in Zionist interpretation. The Jewish religion, it has its own long history. Jewish people, the idea of a Jewish people is a political Zionist invention. Collapse Zionism, there is no Jewish people. There is Jewish religion. So, first of all, we need to realize that the hegemonic ideology of the State of Israel is political Zionism which is the ideology of a settler colonial movement. 
and I'm a student of Elmer Berger and I completely subscribe to his major thesis only within a Zionist framework there is a Jewish people defining the state of Israel as the uh, 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 embodiment of the right of the Jewish people for self-determination is nonsense. Zionist leadership at every level may claim that this nonsense is legitimate. Well, I would, I would put it this way. Should they want to legitimize that uh, uh, kind of nonsense, they have to say, well, the national liberation of the Jewish people is committed to international law. It's anti-colonial. Is, <coughs> is guided by the values of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, etc., etc., etc. Should this be the case, I have no problem with the argument that the Zionism is the expression of the right of the Jewish people to national self-determination. But if under the banner of national self-determination, the <coughs> leadership and the movement claims the right to kick an indigenous people in the face, to ethnically cleanse them, to occupy their land, to occur, uh, 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 perpetrate war crimes against humanity and, uh, and, and, and violate every uh, value in the 30 articles of the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights uh, so far as the Palestinian people are concerned, that, then that <coughs> movement has to be resisted and that ideology has to be collapsed just as the ideology of apartheid in South Africa has successfully been collapsed. The plethora of Israeli <coughs> anti-democratic legislation and the intensification of Israeli apartheid occupation against the Palestinian people in the post-67 occupied territories as well as the 1948 ethnically cleansed and occupied territories, <coughs> I interpret in terms of something our friends told me, uh, South people, democratic friends told me in South Africa, the cruelest and the ugliest measures of oppression of apartheid government in South Africa were perpetrated a few years before they were forced to release Nelson Mandela. Huh. Apartheid basic instruments of apartheid is destruction and oppression and violence. And if level A of destruction, oppression and violence does not work, they try to intensify it. And if the interface does not work, they try to intensify it further. At a certain point, they overdo it and they collapse. In Palestine, I believe we are at about this stage. So, the, so the, this plethora of anti-democratic legislation, to my reading, uh, indicates weakness of things. And it won't help them. Yes. Definitely won't help them. Uh -huh. Apartheid has no future, not in South Africa and not in Palestine. Uh -huh. Very important point. Um, I've noticed that uh, there's been a unification, a convergence of the political tendencies in the Palestinian political culture, and now we have unified action in this Palestinian prisoners strike, hunger strike, initiated by Marwan Barghouti of Fatah, supported by Ahmad Sadat of the PFLP, and now even the leadership of Hamas and Islamic Jihad have joined in to this hunger strike, together with the fact that there's a first ever general strike that took place two weeks ago, that was supported by the two major factions, Fatah and PFLP as well. And there's another general strike that has been declared for this week's Thursday as well. This seems to be uh, a positive development and uh, seems to be happening under the uh, impulse of uh, popular, uh, popular resistance, which is insisting upon some course of action to resolve the unbearable status of the Palestinians living under occupation. Now, I think these political factions are beginning to appreciate the popular consciousness, and Fatah is working very well, and in fact, initiating many such actions. Well, I, I would, uh, 
to put it. I would be reluctant to elaborate on your introduction simply because I'm a second-rung leadership of Fatah and I don't want to exaggerate <coughs> Fatah's role beyond the dimensions that you uh, indicated. So yes, I, I'm very confident of my membership in Fatah and like every national liberation movement, it, it has its huge <coughs> qualities, wonderful qualities. It's, it's a liberal organization and uh, fundamentally democratic, committed to the principle of separation of religion from the state and uh, ideologically liberal. Uh, the only requirement for joining Fatah is a commitment to the liberation of Palestine from uh, Israeli apartheid and occupation. And uh, in terms of ideological uh, affiliation, you get the entire range from Orthodox Muslims and Christians to uh, uh, Marxists and Trotskyites uh, uh, along the, along the uh, curve. So uh, one reason, people ask me quite often, why did you choose to join Fatah if you are a leftist and I regard myself as a socialist? rather than any other Palestinian faction because uh, as, as far as I was concerned I, I joined a movement in good faith and the uh, factions that are regarded as left in the popular front and the democratic front are committed to Marxist ideology and I, for reasons that I won't elaborate in this interview, I'm committed to socialist perspectives, but not necessarily to Marxist ideology, and I would not join in good faith or on an opportunistic basis any political formation. Fatah is, for myself, as a liberal liberation movement, a very, a, a very acceptable and comfortable political home. But I don't want to uh, go along the line of praising, exaggerating the praise of Fatah beyond what you have suggested. So with your permission, let's move to the next question. <laughs> um, very diplomatic answer, I must say. Thank you. And very appropriate, too. Thank you. Let's see now, where are we at? Um, the Palestinian people themselves, I have found while living in Nablus, are both demoralized and very politically motivated at the same time. Engaged, active, consistently determined, and yet dangerously pessimistic. Let's stop here.